Welcome to The Good Word. My name is Vincent Goodwill, Senior NBA Reporter for Yahoo Sports and the host of this show. Today, we are joined by our friend Amin L. Hassan of Meadowlark Media, NBA Radio, and of course, a bunch of other things. What's going on, Amin? What's the word, man? Uh, well, I shouldn't even be so cheerful, as you pointed out right before we started recording. We lost Quincy Jones today, so I'm a little, I'm a little down. Yeah. We're losing, losing a lot of recipes. Yeah. We're losing all the recipes. And and we're losing. Hey, the last the last interview Quincy Jones did that we all remember was him just hey <laughs> firing <laughs> all cylinders. <laughs> I was like, what? He said what about yeah. Marlon Brando? Yeah. And then he said bang bang. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. If you don't know, just look it up. But. Yeah. We got a lot to talk about on the NBA front of me. We're going to talk about the crumbling relationships between players and media, the Cavs and Spurs. But first, let's go to Philadelphia, where Saturday night, I mean, I don't know where you were, but I was at like a birthday party. Yeah. And all of a sudden, my phone starts going off and it says, Joel Embiid shoves reporter. What? That's the alert that you got? What was the, the alert? alert you got? Joel and B just punched somebody. Was what I got. That was, I, was, I said, in the game, he's not even playing. And then it slowly comes out. It's in the locker room. It's a reporter. It's not a punch. It's a shove. All the little details start to unravel there. And I kept thinking, damn, I wonder what Keith Pompey said to him. <laughs> My bad, Keith. But I was like, we said report. I'm like, okay, like keep on paying Philadelphia 76ers. That's that's the guy right. I think of when I think of reporter and the Sixers. But to come to find out it was a columnist from the Philadelphia Inquirer, Marcus Hayes. Yes. If there's I'm trying to think of a more blacker name than Marcus Hayes. Can you imagine <laughs> if Marcus Hayes was like a red-headed, freckled white dude? Can you imagine that? For a second. After I like saw that thing, I thought to myself, wait, what does Marcus look like again? It's like, what if he's white? And I'm just jumping to, to conclusions here. I had this conversation uh, with, with Zach Harper about a week or so ago. I said, Marcus, Quentin, and uh, what's the other one? <laughs> Quincy. Oh, wow. Uh, what, a, what a coincidence that today's the day Quincy Jones passed. But like those were names that I feel like once upon a time, white people had those names and they just... Like white flight, like leaving Jerome. Detroit. They just gave we it away. We took over Jerome. Yep. Jerome, yeah. They love Jerome as well. We they took Dwayne. Dwayne used to be. Dwayne? I, is Dwayne also? Bill Parcells' his real name. Dwayne. Wow. He gave it away. See? He gave right. it away. Uh, uh, was it Jerry Jones? Dwayne? <laughs> Jera. Uh, no, J Jerome. <laughs> hey, Jerome. Derivative of Jerome. Like, yeah. there are some names. J Jerry Seinfeld. He's a Jerome. He's a Jerome. Yeah. Names that never, they're never coming back. They're not coming back. That's the opposite of, of gentrification. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what's, what's never happening again? What's that? Marcus Hayes probably never going into a Philadelphia 76ers uh, locker room. Oh, I think, oh, you think they're banning him or you think? No, not, no, they can't ban him. You can't ban he's him. He's the Inquirer. Yeah, he writes for the Inquirer. They're not going to ban him. No, I, I think Marcus, Mark, that's who he's been. His whole mm -hmm. career, he's been mm -hmm. up, and he did, he did it, uh, no disrespect to Joel Embiid, he did it with a lot scarier people in the past. Like, this guy's been in the Philadelphia area writing about the Sixers and Philadelphia for sports. For a long time. For a long time. So, like, wow, this is shocking and all that stuff. I'm like, it, I, that's a, it's funny when people are like, oh, I bet, you know, like, you scared or whatever. That dude, I'm not saying he was right for what he wrote or whatever, but I'm saying if you think he's intimidated Right. From that situation, I, I I tell you far from it because this is what he does. He's done it forever. Well, let, well let, let's give a reset to the people who don't know. Marcus Hayes wrote a column a couple, maybe it was last week, where he mentioned Joel Embiid's son and his late brother. His late brother's name is Arthur. That's why he named his son, son Arthur in columns, basically questioning Joel Embiid's professionalism, his conditioning, his attendance, right? And he did, here's the thing everybody is caught up. If you want to go read the column, go read the column. Everybody's caught up in the fact that those names were mentioned. I didn't think he was taking a shot at someone's dead brother. It was in bad taste. Yes. Like, I wouldn't have done it. But it wasn't anything derogatory. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, anything, he didn't say, he didn't anything say anything inherently derogatory about it. It just was something that he probably, I would have stayed away from. Because it served no point. 
It's like, uh, you know what it's like? I'll tell you what the equivalent would be. In men's society, when they go in the in the convenience store and they're acting up and then the the store owner says, I feel sorry for your mother, right? That statement <laughs> is not derogatory toward the mother. It's like your mother's a good woman who thought she raised a great child, but turns out she raised uh, <laughs> a, like a piece of shit, basically is what that <laughs> statement means. But there are a lot of people who are like, like my man, O-Dog, was it O-Dog? Yeah, O-Dog. Was O-Dog. Like, well, what you say about my mama? And that's it, right? Like, and, and so that's what sets it off. It's just like the mere mention, right? The mm-hmm. mere mention of my mother in this context. So similarly for Marcus Hayes here, he didn't say, like you say, he didn't say anything wrong or he didn't speak ill of the the passed away brother or the, the young son named after him. But he definitely brought it up in a context of like you letting them down. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it's like, look, man, you want to tell me I'm letting people down? The city of Philadelphia, my teammates, the organization. There's no shortage of people you can pick. You don't have to. You don't have to pick any of my family members. You definitely don't have to pick my brother who passed away at a young age, right? Especially considering like the circumstances where he didn't get a chance to see him when he came yeah. to the states. It's like a sensitive thing. Whenever you bring up a family member, it's not going to be something that someone views rationally, even though we tell athletes to view criticism rationally. Right. So Marcus Hayes goes into the locker room because the 76ers, in light of all this, and Joel Embiid let his displeasure be known a few days before that, Mm -hmm. they were supposed to be facilitating a meeting. And Embiid, who didn't play in their loss to Memphis, Mm -hmm. usually when players don't play, I mean, you know this, you ain't in the locker room after the game. I'm gone. You are long gone. You ain't got a shower. Yeah. You ain't mm-hmm. got a change. You are on the first thing smoking. So Embiid sitting in the locker room, he wanted smoke. He probably, whether he knew or not, whether the 76ers relayed to him, hey, we're going to try to get you two in a room or not. Mm-hmm. He was taking matters into his own hands. He said this, the next time you bring up my dead brother and my son again, you're going to see what I'm going to do to you, and I'm going to have to live with the consequences. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, for all the people who says that B was right to do what he do, he's telling you right there, I know what I'm about to do is not the right thing to do. But I feel compelled to do it anyway, which I, I, I appreciate and respect. That's someone who's telling me, like, he's, <laughs> to mention another hood movie, he's doing the toothpick from Don't Be a Menace. Take me to jail. Throw away the key. Like, basically, I'm not, I'm not scared. I'm right. not scared of the consequences. Not with toothpick. Not toothpick consequences because right, I right, finished yeah, the yeah, rest yeah. of that speech. But he's not, he's like, I'm going to do what I'm going to do and I'm not afraid of the consequences. And by the way, at this point, Vinny, it's still a verbal mm-hmm, altercation. Mm-hmm. It's, it's still just a shouting match, if you will. And here's the thing. When I was a beat writer, mm-hmm. I've written things where I had to show up in the locker room the next day because a source tells you something you get it vetted or whatever it is, and you find out that it's a lot of validity to it, and you're the vessel, and you put it out there. And because it's a source behind it, they can't get mad at the source. They get mad at the vessel. So you show up, and usually, usually, I mean, PR has a pretty good handle on, they know it's been written. They know the player's pissed. They know when you get to the arena and you know you have to show up in the locker room. I've never written anything where I didn't show up in the locker room right when the doors open, not as a flex, but like, hey, I'm available. You got something to say? Open door policy. Yes. Yeah. I I had my say. You can have yours. I got into it with a player. Like my first two months on the beat, I mean, Mm -hmm. and I and and I was like, oh, you got to show up the next day. So I show up the next day. I'm talking to a player with my back turned to the entrance, and said player says, in about five seconds, you're going to hear something. And I'm like, four, three, two. Then player says, I know you ain't in my motherfucking locker room. <laughs> Damn, Rashid said All right, that. <laughs> player X, you want to talk about this or you want to yell at me? And then, and, then it, and then it goes. And it goes for about two minutes. Mm-hmm. He yells. He doesn't say the N-word. He doesn't say the B-word. Everything after that, I think, is by and large fair. You know, I'm going to say fair game. But if you want to air your grievances to something that I wrote, that mm-hmm. I'm standing behind because it's under the it's under the byline, it's under my name, yep. I'm cool with being accountable for it. You think it's BS. 
I know it's not. I can't tell you who my source is. I just have to stand behind it. Yeah, I, I'm going to stand behind yeah. it. So we we barked at each other for about 90 seconds, two minutes, and somebody stepped in and was like, all right, guys, all right. Vinny, you've had your say. <laughs> Player X, you've had your say. Everybody's, you know, right? Yeah. The player has to do that because the team is in there. His teammates are in there, right. and they're watching it. They want, so yep. you have to almost put on, even if you know that everything that's written about you is true, mm -hmm. you have to to do the thing, right? You gotta show, I, show as out, the yeah. professional, I ain't got no back down in me, no way, right? right. This wasn't the player I was going to be physically intimidated by anyway. Like, this ain't exactly, you know, Alonzo Mourning in 2000, 2001 or something. If it was, I'd have been a little more hesitant, but <laughs> it was not. Uh, I mean, when those things happen, beyond, I mean, put it like this, whether it was a punch mm -hmm. or a shove, that goes beyond. Yes. But I don't have a problem in general with you wrote something I didn't like or you th I thought you went up beyond the line. Mm -hmm. Let's have a conversation about it. Where it gets physical is where I draw the line. Uh, this is what I'll say. I will say that he's absolute. There's no place for violence in the workplace ever uh, other than violence was beget upon you. That's right. the only time I can I can condone violence, right? So... Joel Embiid was wrong to take it to a violent place. Having said that, in the words of Chris Rock, but I understand. I get why. And Embiid saying multiple times, I don't, I care not for the consequences, tells me he knows I'm crossing a line. Like he's not like, wait, what did I do? He's not doing that. He's like, okay, there are gonna be repercussions to this. Don't give a f and, and and by the way. That was not his intention, I don't think, because by all accounts, it started with just a very loud ass conversation, right? And the the allegedly the thing that set him off was Embiid said, "I don't care what reporters say," and Marcus Hayes, who again this is very in line with his character, hits him back with, "But you do," <laughs> which is a bar. I mean, absolutely. Like, part of me is like, Marcus, just defuse the situation, man, and let it go. Yep, yep, but all yep. the bottom of me is like, I appreciate that drone strike, man. Because that is <laughs> that is the ultimate Achilles heel of every athlete who says, I don't care what they say, I don't know them. But you do, because you otherwise we wouldn't be in this situation. Re mm -hmm. In reality. And Hit way, dog I, hollered. I'm not saying that he shouldn't care. Right, right. Right? Like, it's natural to care because this isn't, as I like to call people on Twitter, Bums on the street saying, yeah, man, They're like, bum said some stuff about me. I'm just going to walk over him and be like, all right, man, here's a quarter and keep it moving. <laughs> but if it's someone who, you know, regardless of whether you are a beat writer or a columnist who's a general generalist in sports, there is a feeling of, okay, we are inside the city gates now. Mm -hmm. And the people here have been vetted to some degree. They're so, credible. Yeah, at, at the very least, I need to, I should have some care of their opinion of me because their opinion also goes out to millions of other people. So there's nothing wrong with Embiid caring about what dude said. And what dude said is very inflammatory. And Embiid, for his, from his standpoint, understood what I'm doing. If I do this, if I cross this line, it's not like temporary insanity. I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So it's premeditated. It's almost, it's almost like all of this, everyone's got some, everything can be true. It could be true that Mark Hayes wrote something that was in poor taste. It could be true that Joel Embiid shouldn't have shoved them. It could also be true that I kind of understand why he was angry up until that point. Well, the thing that I think has gotten lost in this is that Joel Embiid has not played a game this year, which is the genesis of, Yep. Of the column from Marcus Hayes, where Joel Embiid has barely just got on the floor to play five on five. When the last time we saw him, it was not the NBA playoffs. It was the Olympics mm -hmm. where he was usually, I mean, you go to the Olympics, iron sharpens mm -hmm. iron. You're playing against your peers. You're in the best shape of your life. And you come back ready to start wrecking shop from the moment training camp begins. Joel Embiid, because of, if you want to say, the surgery that he had in the regular season, yep. 
that caused him to basically play less than half of the games, which put Philadelphia in the spot that they were in, in the play in and everything else. And he came and played and he played well on the injury. Then you're wondering, how did you how did you manage to get that much out of shape that quickly when you were supposed to be in shape for the Olympics? Well, it's a chain reaction, Vinny, and it's a chain reaction that starts months ago, right? It starts when he's he's the MVP, he's playing, and there's an al- he misses the game against Denver. There's an allegation that he's ducking Jokic. Mm-hmm. Clearly, he was not physically right. When well, you have the 65 game rule, which I still think is ridiculous. Uh, I, I really? get it. We want it. I think it's ridiculous because w- what we had were players who clearly should not have been playing physically going through stuff, whether it's Embiid and, or Halliburton, those guys mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, put yeah. their seasons and, and perhaps even yeah. their careers at risk to meet a stupid threshold, right? There's not, no, it's a threshold that wasn't needed because as I've said time and time again, other than Bill Walton and a different time and age, who's ever been voted MVP playing 50 games? Nobody. The, the Walton voters, was the only one. Walton the was voters the only one. He played 58 kn- games. Exactly. So the, the voters already know. We already know, have a feel for, there was a year, the first Jokic MVP, a lot of people was like, that's not the best player in the league, but everybody else was hurt. So I can't give it to Embiid, who was better than him that year, because he only played X amount of games. So Jokic, by virtue of just being durable, was MVP in that first year. And obviously, he goes on to win other MVPs, and we're like, yeah, well, clearly this guy's great. But that first one, people are going to forget it was a lot of it was because, man, he played. So I don't think we ever needed that rule, right? But anyways, I digress. So you go now and bead because of those things. It's like, okay, I got to play. I got to play. He plays the game against Golden State. We're watching the game. We're like, this dude is not healthy. He gets hurt. He gets hurt. The Sixers season goes from we're around the top of the East to yep. boom. Now we're in the play-in. He works feverishly to come back. And now here's the fun part. Keith Pompey, the Inquirer. Came on my radio show on Sirius XM NBA Radio and said, I, I kind of feel like he's working hard to come back for the playoffs simply to say, I was here, present, because his real goal was to play in the Olympics. And he was worried that if he doesn't play in the playoffs mm. and he plays in the Olympics, mm-hmm. everyone's going to be like, oh, so you got time to go to France. You ain't got time to play against the Knicks or whatever. So he does that. He plays against the Knicks. He plays great, but. I got to admit, he didn't look physically amazing. He didn't look right. Right? So, again, you are continuing this kind of cycle of you're not rested, you're not fully healed, you're just kind of pushing through it, you get some time off, you go to camp with your Team USA, you play with Team USA, the minutes are up and down, but he plays a big role uh, in the semifinal, I believe, and yep. that allows him to get to the final game, and, uh, you know, the rest is history. He gets his gold medal. And it's like, but man, we're talking about months of this guy wasn't right. He should have been rehabbing probably that entire time, but he wasn't. And so fast forward now, here you are, and you're not ready for the season. And here is the part where it's it's screwy. You know whose fault it is? It's not Joel Embiid's fault. That guy was just trying to play basketball. and It's his body, right? It's not mm-hmm. the doctors. It's not the surgeries. It's not, it's not Marcus Hayes' fault. It's Sixers' front office fault because, Vinny, they're the ones who told us he's great, he's fine, he's all right, he's cool, uh, well, precautionary purposes. The league did the investigation thinking, man, you guys are resting this healthy dude. And it turned out what? Oh, he's hurt for real. What are y'all doing? Y'all are lying on these reports? Basically saying he's fine, but we just wanted it for precautionary periods or whatever. So all of this comes from a lack of transparency which now we are in the gambling age, you have to be transparent. You can't play these gamesmanship games anymore. Yep, You've got to yep. be transparent. And so I put this on Daryl Morey in the front office. They're the ones who are playing these silly games with, with injury reports and stuff. Fruit of a poisonous tree. Mm-hmm. One of my favorite phrases from David Stern? Uh, attorney Joe Proctor. Oh, Fruit <laughs> from a poisonous tree. That's how I, I got my man Tommy off that one time. I, I thought you were going to say Tommy David Stern. <laughs> David they killed him and he was wearing them fresh cement fours, by the way. He was. He was wearing them fresh cement, but I'm looking straight out the box. And I was I saw the blood going and like, damn. Can't wear them no more. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> so we're gonna go back. We're gonna talk later on the last word with the crumbling relationship between players and media because I want to get a mean thoughts on just where we sit as a whole. But transitioning, I mean, to the Spurs. 
Greg Popovich, it just came out this morning. He has a health ailment. Uh, ESPN just reported it. He's going to be out for an indefinite period of time. Mitch Johnson is going to take over. Uh, they play the Clippers tonight, Monday. Then they play Houston on Wednesday. You know, Pop is, what, 75 years old? Like, yeah. you, you're wondering. And the conversation, I think, I mean, was going to be about Victor Wimbanyama and Chris Paul and where the Spurs sit. But I think we have to zoom out a little bit and just wonder where does this franchise go? Because this franchise is Greg Popovich. Like this is, he is their guiding light and their star, mm -hmm. especially in the way that you can say since Tim Duncan has retired because everything revolved around Tim Duncan and, and his excellence. And now it's Pop and they've got Victor and now you've got Chris Paul. Like how do you look, the overview, how do you view this franchise right now? Well, I mean, I think this is, for for many of us, two years ago, before they got Victor Wembanyama, we all thought, all right, Pop, this is it, swan song or whatever. You get the number one pick, maybe, and then you hand it off to someone else, and they, they start their career from there. And then we found out, nope, Pop is signing an extension. He's going to keep coaching. I'm like, well, why is he doing that? Then you see Victor Wembanyama, like, oh, okay, I, now I see why he's doing that, right? And so, the money. And the money. Because the, the, money, I, I, the, the Monty the, Williams, uh, the Monty Williams Memorial. Inflation, yeah. Monty <laughs> package. Infla inflation Stimulus package. Pa stim package, yeah. So, you know, there's a part where you're saying to yourself, all right, maybe you could keep doing this. But we know that the rigors of this game, and we've seen it with other guys who try to coach into their later years, it's it's hard, man. It's The travel is hard. And also, like, the stress levels are not great for any human being, mm -hmm. let alone someone... Uh, you know, basically in in retirement age, past the age of 65. So for Pop, I, I hope he's okay. And I hope this is like a all right, I need to, I need to chill, I need to relax, I need to kind of let go. But for the Spurs, it's interesting because had this been a year ago, I think the transition's a lot easier because again, the team's not good. You got this great player, right, but we right, gotta right. figure it out. But you went out and you got Chris Paul. You went out and got Harrison Barnes. Clearly, the goal, the motivation this season was to be more competitive, to be a team that can compete for a playing spot, maybe even more. Probably not, but at least have an opportunity to do that. So now it's like, okay, well, who do you hand the keys to? And all the people who are the heir apparents of years past, they're all gone, right? They've all gone their separate ways somewhere else. Budenholzer's in Phoenix. Yep. Uh, Quinn Snyder's in Atlanta. Like, yep. those were the main Popovich guys. Yep. And so so, so now you, you turn to Mitch Johnson, who's a young guy, right? Like, he, he doesn't have, like, the extensive resume. Bud was an assistant for how long? And would not leave because he thought, okay, any day now, mm -hmm. Pop is going to call. And then finally it was like, yeah, he's not leaving. He took the Atlanta job, right? Quinn Snyder maybe didn't wait as long, but had been coaching for a while, right? In in uh, particularly in the collegiate on the collegiate ranks, um, you know, you go down the list of all these guys: uh, JB, uh, Jacques Vaughn, Brett Brown. Like these guys all had extensive coaching careers as assistant coaches, and and slash or coaching somewhere else on a head level. Right. And, and right, Mitt Johnson doesn't have any of those things. So does he walk in? I'm assuming they gave it to him. He's going to have the technical aspects out. But does he have the command in the locker room? Not which isn't a young locker room anymore. It's you've got Chris some Paul's going to be coaching that team. <laughs> I mean, pretty Sarge. much. Like you, we're you, calling you, we're calling Chris Paul Sarge. That is Chris <laughs> Paul's name. He it, it used to be the name of uh, Jim Boylan. No, which which the uh, Jim Boylan the pushups. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Norman Dale. Like yep. he's he swore that he was Gene Hackman and Hoosiers. Yeah, they have to use call him Sarge. Now we transition that to old ass Chris Paul. Yep. <laughs> so it, it's it's going to be interesting. And the, no, again, the only reason I say all of that is because it's so unexpected, right? Like yep. Mitch Johnson is a dude that played college when I was scouting college, right? Which, to be fair, so is Joe Mazzula. Right, right. But the difference is, Joe Mazzulla was head coach in in on a collegiate level and had been assistant coach, uh, like had had some amount of a resume that you could go with. 
And, you know, I, I, I don't know anything of Mitch's resume prior to becoming, you know, joining the Spurs three years ago or what, five years ago. Damn. Wow. Maybe I take it back. Wow. <laughs> Dog, I blame oh, Mitch. My bad. It's the pandemic. I was like, you just joined in 2019. I was like, a couple of years ago. I'm like, 2019 oh, does not feel like that long Jesus ago. Jesus Christ. My bad, Mitch. Take, hey, erase everything I just said. <laughs> you, got, you got it, Mitch. <laughs> COVID. We, we all got COVID brain. Damn, man. Like, 2019 does not feel like that long ago. I literally, I literally I'll say like two, three years. That's uh, That was what I was going with right there. Nope. Nope. It was it's 2019. He's the interim head coach. Who knows how long he's going to hold that title. Of course, the Spurs ain't. They're not playing for a championship this year. And, of course, it's Greg Popovich, so you're not going to be trying to rush him back. Mm-hmm. The Chris, pa- Chris Paul has been amazingly effective, as you would, I won't say as you would expect. Yes, as he's, you would expect. His first year is always the best year. But he's almost 40 years old, and there's no archetype for a small guard playing 20 years in the league. That's true. That's what I'm saying, as you wouldn't expect. Exactly. Because there is no... You know, I well, Jason Kidd might have been the closest, but Jason Kidd's a big guard. Huge. You know what I mean? That played that he's long. He's the opposite of, of a small guard. Yeah, exactly. Like Isaiah was, you know, like yeah, the, the I, small archetype yeah. was gone. Zeke was gone. Tim Hardaway was gone. All these other guys were gone. He's the, Chris Paul. Granted, his highs may not have been as high as those other guys, so to speak. Yeah. But he can, he can get you to the floor. He's going to maximize your floor, I think, in yes. ways that, even for him being in year 20. Now, Victor Wembanyama is struggling a little bit. I thought that he was going to be dominating the league this year, and I'm betting, I mean, it's probably a function of that roster more than anything else. Uh, I think, well, it's a couple of things, right? It's part of it is the roster. Part of it is, surprise, the league is tough. There are a lot of good teams, a lot of good players. The The book is out on him now. So we figured some things out. His strength isn't quite where it needs to be, his core strength in particular. And, uh, I heard Chris Paul talk about this the other day where they have a uh, – there's an emphasis on getting Vic with him facing the basket. Like, they don't want him with his back to the basket. They, they want him facing the basket as much as possible. And so I wonder if some of this is also just the chemistry beyond the personnel, but just the chemistry of, like, how we're trying to use him on the board. Right. No, it, it's it's an adjustment period. Like he's shooting seven threes a game. Yeah, at seven foot four or se- whatever height. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like he's still a monster defending the rim. Like and, and San Antonio's defense is like twenty two points per hundred possessions worse than when he's off the floor. It's some, it's some crazy number, maybe twenty four points. It's something like that. So he's still defensively doing, you know, holding up this defense, but mm-hmm. it's not necessarily translating on offense. But on the other side of this, we're going to pause for a minute, but we're going to talk about a good team, a surprisingly good team, the Cleveland Cavaliers. You're listening to The Good Word here on Yahoo Sports. We're back here on The Good Word with Amin al Hassan. Amin, I thought the Cavs would be better this year. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't think that J.B. Bickerstaff was a bad coach or that he was holding them back or anything of the sort. I thought that their development was going to be solely dependent on A, Donovan Mitchell's health, and the development of Evan Mobley, who I still mm-hmm. will buy. If you if you're selling Evan Mobley stock, I will buy buying. all the Evan Mobley. You you selling it? I'm buying. Oh, I'm saying okay, cool. I'm buying, but there's a part of it that's like, all right, man, like <laughs> we'll get to he's, it. Go he's ahead. slim dunking, not Tim Duncan. And I <laughs> yeah. just I don't know if he's going to be putting on that Tim Duncan base that that really helps him in that way that he can play out of the post. But with Kenny Atkinson, man. 7 and 0. They beat the Bucks after in Milwaukee with Dame had a game, had 10 threes, Giannis had a huge game, Donovan Mitchell had a game winner with like 0.3 seconds left or whatever it was. Like they took the Bucks best shot. They're going to play them again on Monday night in Cleveland. Second in offensive rating, fifth in defensive rating. Last year they were sixth, but last year offensively they were 18th. So offensively they're a much better team. Is this something that is sustainable? Do you see these factors being sustainable? Are they an Eastern Conference party crasher? I think I think first of all, Coach Atkinson has always been a great coach. Um, I've known him since he was an assistant under Mike D'Antoni in New York. Um, he's he comes with an impeccable resume and a great work ethic. I thought what he did in Brooklyn, in the years leading up to the acquisition of Kevin Durant, and Kyrie Irving, without draft pick, high draft picks, without. Mm-hmm a whole lot of financial flexibility. He was able to coach that team up. And a big reason why those guys looked at it as a viable place beyond it being in the New York City area was also because they weren't, I mean, I, like the if the Nets had been 17 and 65, 
Like they could say, yeah, we can turn any team around, but I don't know if they would have joined a team that was 17 and 65. Right. So I think Coach Atkinson is a really good coach. At the same time, he's got a very demanding style, right? And that didn't work with Kyrie and Kevin Durant at the time. And then he goes to Golden State and he's an assistant there and, and he gets the Charlotte job and then turns around he and says, says nah, I'm straight. Never mind, right? And so I, I wondered, wow, I was like, what's what what happened? What changed, right? And how much of that has to do with like, yeah, I'm gonna coach these guys up. I'm not gonna pull punches or whatever. So you get to Cleveland, and I thought to myself, if they are receptive. I think they're going to make a huge leap and kudos to the players. They have been receptive and the leap they've made, I don't think is a mirage. I think they are this good. And Vinny, I'm going I'm to take it one further. I think they could be better because Evan Mobley still hasn't come out of his cage yet. He's still mm -hmm. timid. He's not Tim Duncan. He's timid Duncan, right? <laughs> like he's still kind of being respectful and like, there's a level to be a star in this league. And I think Evan Mobley, like you, I buy in a stock. I think he can be an absolute star. But to be a star, there is a dash of asshole you have to have. And when I say asshole, what I mean is I'm not worried about people's feelings. Mm -hmm. I am going to be mm -hmm. demanding in a way that is not always going to be worried about, well, how, how's everyone else going to think? I'm not saying that you have to go all out like being terrible to your teammates, but just a level of confidence that goes beyond courtesy. Mm -hmm. He's still courteous. He's still a little too courteous. And I think he needs to be more aggressive and more demanding because ultimately the ceiling of this team is Evan Mobley being the, the, the hub of all, of all of what happens. I mean, Evan Mobley taking the mantle makes Donovan Mitchell a better Donovan Mitchell while yes. he's there. Yes. You, you know what I mean? And like, whether he plays the four or the five, like, I'm not as concerned as others about, well, he's got to shoot better. My thing is, if you're a dominant big, other teams are going to have to adjust to you. Like, if you bring that dash of mean that, you know, to bring Greg Popovich in, play mm -hmm. with some nasty, if you play with some nasty, other teams are going to have to load up and double on you, and you're going to make other teams adjust. Mm -hmm. And Jared Allen is as solid as you can expect someone with his experience to be like, we've seen them say the best of him, but we've seen what Jared, where Jared Allen is, which is a really, really good all-star capable center. Mm -hmm. Of but a certain kind. Right. All-star capable of a certain kind. Yes. Yes. Of a certain, like, like the Jamal McGlure type of all-star. Oh man, <laughs> we're not going to do that. No, That's... like the all-star that makes the all-star team one time. You know what I mean? Like that guy. Oh, like no, we I, could... I, I, I think Jared Allen will make more than one, one time. I think Jared yeah. Allen is good enough to be a... I think Jared Allen, I'm not saying he's as good as this player, but he's as good enough to be this kind of multiple-time all-star. Like a Rudy Gobert all-star. Okay. Right? Like, I'm not saying he's as good as Rudy Gobert, but I'm saying, like, right. that's... Like, he's not, that's he's that not here because he averaged 25 and 15. Like, he's here because we respect his contributions on the defensive end. Yeah. I mean, look, I think in the Eastern Conference, I've, I think the Knicks are going to be okay in general, right? Mm -hmm. But Tom Thibodeau will still play his dudes 45 minutes if he could. The Bucks got real-life issues. The 76ers got real-life issues. Paulo Bancaro in Orlando is out for six, four to six weeks, mm. and I thought that they were going to be the team to sort of ascend. But when your best player is out for that long, that really curtails your ability to have the continuity. For Maybe Cleveland that, is that team. For a team that already struggles to to generate offense. That's the thing yep. about Orlando. It's not just their best players. I was like, they already weren't great at scoring the ball. Now mm -hmm. they lost their best scorer. That that can be tough, as we saw the other night. You know, they just, against Dallas. They couldn't. Could, hey, what, 85, just, 85 points or whatever against. Dude, just, I don't, I'm not mad at them. I'm like, yeah, like you're, you're, you're basically, you're missing 25 points a game. I'm right there. Now, quick thing, because I brought up Milwaukee and this wasn't on the rundown. Mm. How concerned are we about Giannis and, and, and that whole situation. I, there. I saw the report and I'm like, look, Giannis is not LeBron. He doesn't do the breadcrumb thing, right? Le LeBron, you know, me, me and Sedano came up with this years and years ago when we were on uh, on ESPN. We had the NBA Lockdown podcast. We talked about, is LeBron leaving breadcrumbs was the question for the producer. We were like, LeBron doesn't leave breadcrumbs. He loves whole loaves of bread, right? 
but it's like super like i'll never tell like the fit in fit out tweet like that's yeah, how lebron yeah, is yeah Giannis comes out and says yeah if things don't change i I'm, might have to like he's very blunt and and direct like that and i think also he's not knee jerk like right. he when he says it he waits until the moment where he means it so i see this report and i'm like yeah i don't know if that's the case quite yet like it's it's the report was rival execs are speculating and i'm like that's just people that's people talking people talking like and i know what they're doing they're doing they're like oh it's not going right for you milwaukee oh how about some hot sauce on those wounds right there let's make it let's make you guys have to talk about this every day in the media until everyone's frustrated the situation so hey hey you know what that is i mean you see a woman that ain't happy you i don't know why you I don't you, know, ain't gonna, you, you ain't gonna go directly to her and start dirty macking. You know what you do? You go you to her do? girlfriends. Hey man, she don't she don't look happy. Why she got the long face? What's going on with her? You know what oh, I'm saying? I, like, see, I'm, you know, I'm honest. Got... I, I I go to ah man. He needs to treat you better than that. Like that's that's <laughs> wrong. <laughs> you go straight dirty back, huh? Oh yeah, I can't. I can't believe he was like what he said that to you. That's immature. That's what that is. You know, and, and by the way, for those taking notes, this is how you cut it, undercut it. You start to, you encourage her to keep trying to work at it. Because then it's like, oh, I'm just a good dude giving advice, man. Like, look, it, look, look, if he's the man that I think he is, if he's the man that's worth you, then he's going to work at it. He's going to get yeah. better. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's got it. He, I mean, you chose him. He's got to be the man that you yeah. think he is. Because I wouldn't question your, your decision making. Uh huh. Yes, not when you, you got somebody like me in your face. You, you know what I mean? That that, you're right. not saying that last nope. part, you're but good, it's good. inferred that you're saying that last part. Like a media person walking into a locker room after they've written an incendiary article, you're open door <laughs> policy. I'm available. I'm not saying come at me, bro, but I'm just saying I'm available. I'm here. I'm here. Come talk to me. That's all. That's all. I'm here. Hey, look, baby. You know, I know you got your situation and everything, and I ain't trying to step on that. That's cool. You know, I'm here as a friend if you need me. That's it. I've seen that happen so many times. The next thing you know, that woman, it, that woman done messed around and got with the Dirty Mac dude. And I'm going to tell you this. I ain't no Dirty Mac. That is not my game. I'm not saying a means game is Dirty Mac. I'm <laughs> Amin, right right, for those who I don't see it on YouTube, Amin just did yeah. a, a tip of the hat. A tip yeah. of the hat to your boy. I came out the dugout and I waved to the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I don't I'm know that guy. Who cares? I'm not, I'm not I'm not, I don't know that guy. Like, it's not dirty back if you don't know the guy. That's how I feel. Yeah, like, it's a stranger. Why do I care? That's a good point. But uh, here's the thing. <laughs> Nobody... In this world where it gets smaller than ever, you're never more than a, a degree of separation away from anybody, yeah. damn Yeah, we're, we're, we are one degree of separation. The girl. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get back on topic, man. So Let's anyways. get back on topic. Now, look, this is the one thing I do, this is one thing I do want to hit you with, I mean, because we just, we look, Cle Cleveland can say that we gave him some time, right? Yep. I mean, Grant Williams, <laughs> who decides that he is going to be vigilante justice on my boys, yes. right? Former Celtic, he gave Jason Tatum. You know what's funny? I haven't seen a full court shove like that, I mean, since Caitlin Clark got shoved like that oh. full court. And the girl put her hands up like, wasn't me, my bad, I didn't mean to do it. And everybody said, that wasn't a flagrant foul. Where Grant Williams did it, it was, it was World War III. I wonder what the difference was. Now, now, the funny part about that is, I mean, Draymond Green of all people, after Grant Williams got ejected, you know, Charlotte got blown out in yeah. Boston and everything else. And Jason Tatum didn't start anything because I don't think we're going to see Jason Tatum fighting. Right? I think to. we can see Jalen Brown fighting. I think we're going to see Jason Tatum fight. Yeah, but he doesn't it need took to. Draymond Green to be out here calling Grant Williams a goofy. <laughs> that's that's bad. That's <laughs> bad, man. <laughs> I You know, it's funny. I, you watch Charlotte do these first five or six games. There clearly is an effort to change the perception of who they are, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Charles Lee has clearly made defense and kind of grittiness and toughness a priority. Uh, LaMelo Ball through five games or whatever has played He's more balling. defense. And, 
but and also defensively, I've seen him play, mm-hmm. give more effort on that end than yep. I have in the four years since he got drafted. So we'll start with the positives there. Sometimes when you have an edict, hey, this is how we do things now. There's always someone who takes it a little too far. I think Grant just took it a little too far. I think there's a combination of like, hey, this is what we're trying to be here, what we're trying to do. And also maybe trying to prove to his teammates or just because like, this guy's my friend doesn't mean he's above the marching orders. In the same way that in 2008 in the Olympics where Kobe said, the first time Pal sets the screen on me, I'm going to just annihilate. I'm going to run right through him and did exactly that. And that energized Team USA and also like made Pal go like, I thought we were friends. Like it was, it was <laughs> a combination effect there from Kobe. So I think that's probably what Grant Williams was trying to do, trying to send a message to the team. Like, I don't care. Even if my boys are out there, I, 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 I will do this. I will uphold these ideals. Um, yeah, I, you know, it's basketball. At, this, at the end of the day, I'm like, it was, I thought people made a bigger deal about it than it, than it should have been. I think it was funny because Joe Mazzulla a couple of days prior to yeah. who, yep. let me say this. And I've you said it before. Call I mean, you know what we call, we call him on, on oddball. We call him crazy Joe Mazzulla. That's, <laughs> that's his name, man. You want to act crazy? You crazy, bro. I'm like, well, who am I to be like, well, no, I'm not going to use that term. Like, Hey man, I'm, I'm from the nineties. <laughs> Someone had like that. He crazy. Is it like, do you, do you get mad? Like, nah, he's just crazy. Don't listen to him. They, they used to call me crazy, Joe. Now they call me Batman. <laughs> 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 I am increasingly becoming more of a fan of Joe Mazzulla, the character. In large part because we don't have characters in coaching anymore. Like, they all look the same. They all dress in the, in the quarter zips and the Nikes or whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, you don't see the colorfulness and even how they dress. And usually, I mean, what happens is you can look through history. And I think of, like, Phil Jackson and Pat Riley. When those guys won championships at young ages, all of a sudden they became like the voice of the league in a way where you'd start flexing a little bit. Phil Jackson would talk about how bad the Pistons were and the Knicks and all this other type Mm -hmm. of stuff. And you know what I mean? And the Spurs weren't real champions because I wasn't here this year. Like that that, that type of stuff. Joe Mazzulla saying, hey, y'all. We should have, we should bring back fight. I never knew that they allowed fighting. I don't know what NBA Joe Mazzulla was actually watching because they've never allowed fighting. And as I told y'all last week, white people don't want to see black people fighting. Yep. That's, that's, but a, pretty, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty way to put it. I mean. You know, it's, uh, I, I want to just on that point there. Go ahead. I know, I feel like every time I come on the show, we do, we do a segment that is basically, man, if David Stern were here. <laughs> but then, like, if David Stern were here, man, what would Joe, Joe Mazzulla would have to, they would have flown his ass to New York. That ain't no phone call. You got to come to the office. And then you get MF'd, and then you go back, and the next press conference you say is like, guys, I was just playing around. Obviously, that like the idea that he got zero repercussions for that. Man, what are we doing, man? Like, am I, am I the only one out here trying to preserve the integrity of our sport? <laughs> why? Look, why am I harder? Look, look. But, what, like, I'll give you a good example, Vinny. How many? How many games did Joel and BB suspended? That's a great question. The problem is, put it like this. I don't think he'll be suspended. I think they'll give him a big fine. Because I don't think Adam Silver, the guy who wants the media out of locker rooms because he listens to one player in particular, I don't think that Adam Silver is going to take the side of the media, so to speak, even in the case of physical contact. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I think that Adam will be advised by people in the league office that he needs to take a strong stand against this. I don't know how strong of a stand Adam will take. I would say five games max. But all Philly is going to say is, oh, he's healthy right now, and he'll sit the the five games before he's actually actually ready to play. If they do that, we bring the doctor board out. (laughs) (laughs) So what do you you think David Stern would have done with with Joel Embiid? I I think he would have given a suspension that probably would have been appealed by the union and then commuted down. Put it like that. And we might end up at five. We're not starting at five. The emperor. He's the emperor for a reason, yeah. dog. I miss David Stern. That's I never thought I'd say, say I, miss- I, I never thought I'd say that. I never thought I'd say that. But like I like there when when I feel like there are certain inflection points in what happens in our league. I'm not talking about Grant Williams 
giving a, a, a hip check to Jason Tatum. That's to me, that's basketball. It's right. You get a, a flagrant, you get ejected, whatever. That's basketball. I'm talking about inflection points like putting your hands on, obviously putting your hands on, on the patrons, putting your hands on media, right? Um, uh, what do you call it? Insinuating that the refs are on the take. Yep. Right? These are things that go beyond, ah, you're sorry, just find them 10,000, 20,000. Like it's one thing to say, you could say the refs are stupid. You could say they're dumb. They're blind. You could say, you could even say they don't like me. So-and-so doesn't like me. That's why he didn't give me that call. What you cannot say is you can't rub your fingers and say, oh, it's there on the tape. You can't do that. You can't, you can't do that. You can't. There's certain just lines you don't cross. Or if you, you cross them at your own peril. As uh, Peter Goober said, there are no rules, but you, you break them at your own peril, right? That's, that's, that's how it should be. And some of these things happen, and I'm like, there has to be a repercussion. It cannot, we cannot just move on. And, and, and that's one of them, I thought. I think if the league office decides that we're not taking Joe Mazzula seriously because we're just not going to. This is, this is the man who, when we said, when someone asked him, hey, how does it feel to have two black coaches in the finals for the first time since 1975? And he said, I wonder how many of them were Christian coaches. That's when the league probably figured out the wires ain't quite crossing the right way up there. So when he comes out and says entertainment, fighting, the league is probably like, we're not going to give this more oxygen than it needs to have. But sure. Emperor Stern would have had his ass at Olympic but Tower. Yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Like, exactly. Emperor Stern doesn't have a statement about how he fined Joe Mazzullo. You just, you get called into the office, you get your eyebrows singed off, and you go home. And everyone's like, hey, man, what happened to your eyebrows? Like, uh, nothing. <laughs> By the way, remember that thing I said? Oh, I'm just kidding, man. Don't, don't take me seriously. I was tripping. And, and to answer the question, as I did the day he said it, how many of them were Christian? All of them, Joe. All of them. Every single every one. Last, every last one of them. <laughs> every Cause, cause every you know black what? coach in the NBA Finals has been Christian. Let's let's clear that up right now. We're still waiting on the first Muslim or Jewish or Buddhist one. Because if they were anything else, we would know. Would add a million think pieces about it. Yes, we would. We're going to take our last ad break, and we'll be right back with today's last word. Now it's time for today's last word. I mean, the Joel Embiid stuff, it just brought to me to a head. Like, I thought about the Patrick Beverly stuff with Melinda Adams during the playoffs last year where mm -hmm. he didn't want her recording his post-game interview because she didn't subscribe to his podcast and all this other type of stuff. And Speaking now you got Joel Embiid shoving or punching or whatever it was physically that happened there. Yeah. And I just think of the crumbling relationship between players and media. Mm-hmm. And social media plays a part of it. I want to say sensitivity of athletes play a part. It, it feels like mm -hmm. there's the closer that we've gotten, the less humanity that there is seen between either side because you have so many more opinions and so much more demand for opinions, even in spaces like this where you got podcasts and you got, mm -hmm. you know, Twitter and everything else. I mean, do we get out of this space or is this like, going downhill for for the next inflection point. Yeah, you, you know the the fun the funny thing about it Vinny is it's not just the deterioration but also what ends up happening is the rise of the I don't want to call it toothless but like just absolute propaganda machine. Meaning as the deterioration with the media as a whole continues there's a rise of media people who all I say is everything that you, makes you happy and smile. And so objectivity is not a thing anymore. And we get a lot of uncritical reporting and columns and missives, right? And on the other side, you get people who are like cottage industry of just being abrasive and twisting words and quotes and just being trying to be cantankerous in any way because that gets a reaction and that gets traction as well and so the demise i'm worried about isn't that oh all the athletes are going to hate the media it's the polarization of either we get like mudslinging 
or glazing, for lack of a better term, and the in-between of where I can say objectively objective things about you and not cross any lines of decency or whatever. But also, it's other times, like, uh, people, it's funny, like, there are players that I know have a specific issue with me. And the feeling is mutual. But I, I will never allow it to be like, that guy sucks. If I think you right. suck, it's because I thought you sucked way before I understood your feelings for me, right? Right. Like, but like, they're play, like, if there's someone's good, I, got, I can't. There's a can't player, there's a Hall of Famer who I know, a future Hall of Famer, because he's still playing right now, who I know does not like me and has told people, oh, if I see him, I'm going to slap him or whatever. And I'm just like, one, you're not going to do that because you've been in front of me and you didn't do shit then, right? Number two, though, that's not going to stop me from saying, man, you're really fucking good at your job, man. You're really good. You've had some mistakes. You've had some pitfalls or whatever. I mean, I'm going to point those out. But at the end of the day, I cannot deny your impact on the basketball court. Right. People like me are going to go away, I feel like. People like me and you who who are just calling it how it is. Sometimes I mm -hmm. like you or uh, like what you're doing. Sometimes I don't like what you're doing. It's not personal. Right. And what we're going to see is just more of this polarization where it's either the Skip Bayless mold of like, oh, you are da-da-da-da. And even when he says something positive, it's like it only serves the purpose to feed another negative agenda somewhere else. Like yep. Bronny's clutch. That's a Skip Bayless original, unlike his dad. That's all yeah, it is. Yeah, it's just yeah, to say yeah. unlike his dad, right? Yeah. Or the other side is like, oh, my God, da, da, da. Like it, it, it's the Today Show or whatever, like where everybody right. is just awesome, beautiful people, and no one ever does anything wrong, and anything that happens is not their fault. So Joel Embiid shoved this guy. Well, clearly, Joel Embiid, totally fine. Right. This guy deserved it. When the reality is, it's in the middle. This guy may have deserved it, but also Joel Embiid was wrong to do that. It's a weird thing, I mean, because players, when play when players get mad at me about what they think my role is, and I try to educate them, a lot of times, I mean, they have zero clue what the media's role is because no. they've been fed information mm -hmm. by the by the system so to speak mm -hmm. that says oh i thought you worked for us no 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 i cover you i don't work for the team but when they when they see certain media types around that kick it a certain way or they mm -hmm. see skip bayless on the other side so to speak right they don't know the responsibility they're not being properly trained vetted so to speak on what our roles are like if you're going to play bad, I'm going to say you're going to play bad. I've told players this, and I've said this to guys. I'll never write anything that I won't say to your face. And that's not from a standpoint of, oh, I'm so tough. But the humanity and how I approach you and address you, I won't write something that I can't defend in, let's lack of a better phrase, a jury of my peers. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like that's where it sits. And a lot of times people sit on the ivory perch and they, you know, they shoot sniper shots or the people, like you said, who are glazing, oh, everything they do is just so great. And we can't, we can never criticize them because they're millionaires and they make all mm -hmm. this money and da 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 da. Like, no, this, like, you can say That's someone played bad. You can say someone choked. Like, the evidence is there without A, getting personal or B, me being unfair. Like, I don't have to be unfair when I'm saying something critical about you. And also, I'm going to be accountable when, after I say something critical about you because you're going to know that I'm there. I'm not saying it to be big and bad, but you're going to know huh. that I'm there. Dude. And also, I mean, I got to uh -huh. say this. When players step over onto the media side, it's almost like th there's a less respect for what it took to get there. Oh, if you didn't play, you can't have an opinion. Well, that's if that's the case, why are some of the best coaches and executives in sports guys who didn't play at all? Right. Like, there has to be more of a, a general respect for what everybody does, like you said, to prevent this schism that is getting wider and wider. It's weird because that opinion never happens to come from people who actually know you, right? So I'll give you a great example. I remember Shaq told me, 
yo, you're gonna get you're gonna get killed out here. And I said, why? He said, you 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 talk too much. Right? And and it was some spe- I can't remember what the specific thing was, but it was something I was very critical on on TV. And I said, is this because of that? And he's like, yeah. And I said, was I wrong? He said, but you don't have G14 classification. I said, but big fellow, was I wrong? And he looked at me and said, you weren't wrong. So like Shaq, because he knows who I am, he's like, the dude knows his Right. Like now, Shaq's objection with me is like, you're not allowed to say that because you aren't a Hall of Famer. You're not G14 classification, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. That's fair. I'll accept that criticism from anybody. Say it's not my place to say that. But I'll say I don't know shit because I, I count the Hall of Famers who, who, all, who all vouch for me. I'm, people who the reason you play basketball vouch for me. Mm-hmm. So like, there's no opinion that's going to come from a player that my opinion is invalid that's ever going to happen, right? I think that's a part of it where it's just a lazy branch to grab for in the same mm-hmm. way that media people who say the re- only reason he's on TV is because he won a championship or won some rings or, 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 or won MVP or whatever. Like, look, yes, there are some people who are only on TV because of their basketball playing resume and they're terrible at TV. But there are also a lot of these guys who are really f***ing good at their job Absolutely. in the same way that, yes, there are some media people who don't know shit about basketball. But there are also some many people who know a lot and, and are not disqualified based on their knowledge level. So it's just one of those things where I think everyone is in a place where we're, we're polarized. And, and a lot of it is, like you said, because people, I won't say players, people are uneducated on mm-hmm. what different media is. They can't tell the difference, for instance, between a Chris Haynes who's breaking a news story versus a Stephen A. Smith who says Kevin Durant's not a good, great leader, which he said on first take last, last week. Right. They see Chris Haynes and Stephen A. Smith in the same vein. And, and it's not an attack on either one of those guys. Both these people are people I know and, and, and I'm friends with. People don't They're know the difference same. between a reporter and a columnist and an and, analyst. Yeah, they don't like know that, the difference. They don't know the difference. And so you start there, and that informs a lot of why people are upset because they're upset about what opinion people said. They start to want to deny factual things that reporters are reporting and you you have to be able to juggle these d- different things in the same way that i can't watch a soccer game and say why the hell is he touching it with his hands because that is the goalie like <laughs> he's allowed to do that the other ones can't <laughs> so there's no confusion if you understood that but if you're right. just watching soccer and you say okay can't touch your hand wait is it, what about him like that's that's where it comes from. So a lot of it is education, but do people want to be educated on that? I don't know. People just want to yell at the internet, man. Do people want to be educated? That is the... Yeah, they, they want to be confirmed. They want to be affirmed. They mm-hmm. don't want to be told something that they don't know. And because in large part, it's really humbling to be humbled. You got to you gotta really... Bend the knee and be like, okay, I don't know the difference. Can someone tell me the difference? And to be perfectly honest, most players want to know what the difference is because they want to know what they can get mad at and what they can't. Some don't. Don't get me wrong. Some Some do not. But most of them, if they have some level of relationship, they kind of do want to know. The ones that don't, they just, they don't because they want to yell. And if that's the case, go ahead and yell at, go ahead and yell at this empty vessel or whatever. That, ladies and gentlemen, is Amin Al Hassan. Thanks to Amin <laughs> for giving us some of his time today. Thanks to producer John and the entire team who worked so hard behind the scenes on this show. If you haven't already, go subscribe to The Good Word with Goodwill wherever you get your podcast. Leave us a rating and review. I'll be back on Wednesday with another episode. Until then, everybody be safe. <laughs>